In today's video, we look at nutrition for peak performance, and brain rule number five is feed it. Fueling our brains with the right types of foods has a big impact on how well you can perform at work and play. So what are the best brain foods? In this video, we look at the importance of both glucose and omega-3 fatty acids, and look at how caffeine can be used to enhance performance. Brain rule number five is feed it. This is all about nutrition, a subject of which there is a lot of myth and rubbish written out there. We want to look at what is the best food for your body and your brain. When we're thinking about eating for peak performance, optimizing the interaction between the brain and the body, I've got seven words. Eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Let's dissect that. Eat food. What is food? Food is defined as something that either would rot in two days and or your grandmother would recognise as actually being food. If it's not in one of those two categories, it's what we call an edible food-like substance. The ultimate edible food-like substance I'm thinking of, you might remember the old Twinkie, the cream-filled sponge snack, the one that I've had sitting on my desk now for four years that not even the bacteria will eat. Yeah, it's still in its wrapper, but you can push it down and the cream goes out and comes straight back in again like the day it was made. It's actually not food. And you'll see this in your supermarket when you wander around the outside, the actual food, the real food, the stuff that rots, is around the outside. Supermarket shopping tip number one, shop on the outsides. That's where the actual food is. Mostly plants, not too much. Humans grew up on plants and lean meat. One way to judge the food that we're eating is whether it's a plant or recently grazed on plants. And our animals need to be lean. Some of the best food we can get is the food that swims in the ocean. It's closest to its natural state. It's moving all day. Not too much. What do we mean by not too much? How do you tell when you're full or not? Humans, as a rule, are very poor judges of eating until we're full. Here's a couple of experiments a colleague of mine in the US did in the last couple of years, Brian Weinsink. He has a, a metabolic kitchen attached to his office and he does all sorts of experiments looking at how much people consume under different conditions. In the first study, he gave people food on a 10-inch plate and on another occasion on a 12-inch plate. People with the bigger plates ate 22% more to feel just as full. In other words, serving food on a small plate will make you just as full and you'll eat quite a bit less. In a second study, he served people food in what the Americans call family style. In other words, there were big platters of food in the middle of the table and people could help themselves to the food. Under those conditions, men ate 100% more than when the food was simply a couple of metres away. If you have to get up to get your food, you probably won't. If it's right in front of you, you might eat twice as much. Finally, he looked at how much people ate when the TV was on or off. And the answer is, when the TV's on, people ate about 10% more on the average. So, it's not all about calorie control, but what is important if you're concerned about regulating the amount you eat is to control the landscape in which you eat your food. Small plates, the TV off, concentrate on enjoying what you're eating is the way to go. Diets are not the way ahead. They don't work in the long run. In fact, you may be surprised to find they make you fat in the long run. What does work is sustainable change. So let's have a drill down and look at the different macro and micronutrients that comprise what we call nutrition. Firstly, let's talk protein. 
This is the nutrient that most people in the Western world overconsume, particularly now when high protein diets are fashionable. So let's look at high protein diets. Do they work for weight loss? Yes, about as much as a high carbohydrate diet or any other diet. The reason they work for weight loss is because of what we call metabolic inefficiency. The body can only store a certain amount of protein. Anything that we consume over that, it either stores as fat or it converts it into carbohydrate or glucose that the brain is craving and that we're not getting. It does this through the liver, which makes the liver work extremely hard. And then there's a byproduct of this that has to be excreted out of the body through the kidney. So it makes the kidneys work extremely hard as well. The other thing about high protein diets is they're very high in sulfur or acid. Our body doesn't like an acidic environment. So it has to neutralize the acid and it uses calcium, which we store in our bones. If you're a postmenopausal woman, this might cause alarm, and it should. High protein diets come with dangers. We need to think about the body and the brain, just not weight loss. So on the subject of protein, a good guide is to look at the lifestyle of the animal that you're eating, if indeed it is animal protein. We know that things that move a lot, such as fish or anything from the ocean, is very, very good for your body and your brain. We know that things like kangaroos or game birds or any form of game animal that moves a lot is much more nutritious. We know that chickens that are free range are much healthier and more nutritious than battery chickens. And we know that cows and pigs that are kept in confined places and fed hormones are actually not that nutritious for us. So we also should look at plant sources of protein from things such as beans and legumes and certain different types of grains and eggs and also some dairy stuff. So that's protein. Let's now talk about fat. The worst thing that the health and fitness industry ever did was declare war on fat. If you don't eat fat, your body and brain decays rapidly. But fats are not created equally. Let's have a look at the different types of fat. Most of us know that saturated fat isn't good for you, but another fat that is created through food processing called trans fats or hydrogenated fats are the fats of the devil. These stuff harden the very cells that create us and keep us alive. Another type of fat is omega-6 fat. That comes from vegetable oils. We know we need some of that if we get too much, as most people in the Western world do, it creates inflammation in the body, which causes disease, particularly if we don't get enough of the really good fat, which is omega-3 fats. The best source, without a shadow of a doubt, is fish and fish oil. But make sure your fish oil is screened for mercury. This stuff coats all of the nerves in your body and brain and comprises 10% of your brain's weight. Most depressed people have deficiencies in omega-3 fats and actually omega-3 fats are a pretty good treatment for depression. The other types of fats are monosaturated, such as avocado and olive oil. This stuff is great. It produces the really good cholesterol and it helps the body to resolve inflammation. They work in with omega-3s to keep you healthy and vital. Now let's talk carbohydrates. The simple rule is go for unprocessed stuff. Sugar and processed carbohydrates such as white bread and white rice are not good for the body. 
whole grains and more complex carbohydrates such as legumes and beans and also probably the king which is oats or oatmeal is actually great for your body but tremendous for your brain. The brain is 3% of the body's weight, yet uses 25 to 30% of the body's glucose. If you drop your glucose levels too low, you go into a coma and you die. That's why the body has lots of hormones that break down protein to create glucose. So be kind to your brain. Eat plenty of unprocessed carbohydrates. Let's now talk about vitamins, minerals, and supplements in general. It's a $400 billion industry. What we actually know about antioxidant supplements, which is a huge industry in and of itself, that if you take antioxidant supplements, particularly individual antioxidants, such as vitamin A or vitamin E, on average, you will live one year less. That's what the biggest study on antioxidant supplements showed a couple of years ago. Contrast this with fruit and vegetables. If we take a multivitamin and mineral, which may not be a bad idea, but there's 40 nutrients in a really good multivitamin and mineral, the average piece of fruit or vegetable has between 10 and 15,000 nutrients. It's not all about the essential vitamins and minerals that we know about, but now we're realizing the power of all of these phytochemicals and flavonoids and polyphenols that we find in naturally occurring food. Save your money, most of it is expensive urine, spend it on fruit and vegetables. Lastly, I want to talk about caffeine. Lots of us are caffeineaholics. We drink far too much of the stuff. Caffeine, when used in small amounts and used strategically, is very good for your brain. It helps to improve focus and can help learning and memory. So use it before a meeting or something important but really, you should be capping it at two to three cups of coffee a day. And most energy drinks are very bad, apart from if you're driving and about to fall asleep. So summarize nutrition for the brain. We want to get a good steady supply of unprocessed carbohydrates. We want lots of omega-3 fats from fish, nuts, and seeds, and we want some good quality lean protein and lots of water. Today, we have shown you the foods to eat if you want to boost your brain power. Paul also told us why using caffeine strategically gives your brain a short-term boost. And we also heard how the brain needs carbohydrate. So don't go on a low-carb diet unless, of course, you want less brain power. You can change your diet to improve brain function. So go on, save yourself. Thank you.